in the face of various voices whispering that Ukraine is losing the war against Russia and the question of what it would take to win the war anyway, this week, Ukrainian President Zelensky launched what is described as his victory plan. What was made public, first to the Ukraine parliament and then subsequently to international leaders, was a five-point plan. Actually, I say it was a five-point plan. It's actually an eight-point plan, I understand, but three of the points are secret, shared only with key partners in private. Obviously, we can't really comment on those, so let's take it for now as indeed a five-point plan. And it goes like this. First, that Ukraine should become a member of NATO and that it should therefore be invited to join without delay. Not that it would join overnight, but that it would be an ironclad invitation to leave no shred of doubt on the direction of travel. An invitation is a strong decision that requires nothing but determination, said Zelensky. NATO member countries have committed to what might arguably be described as weasel words, what is described as Kiev's irreversible path to membership, which is not an actual invitation. Second, Ukraine is able to bolster its defence, including air defence systems and the ability to use all its weapons as needed to hit targets deep inside Russia. Ukraine has put together a list of weapons needed to protect itself and to bring war close to home for the Kremlin. Third, Ukraine says it should deploy on its territory a comprehensive non-nuclear strategic deterrence package. You can spend some time pondering what that might be made up of. The details have not been spelled out, but Zelensky notes that the US, Germany, France and the UK all know Kiev's asks. Fourth, focuses on strategic economic potential. Ukraine suggests that it should sign partnership agreements with the EU and the US for the use of Ukraine's critical resources, such as lithium, gas, titanium and others. And then finally, fifth, Ukraine offers the benefit of its battle-hardened military to benefit European security once the current conflict is ended. Zelensky said this, If the partners agree, we envisage replacing certain military contingents of the US armed forces stationed in Europe with Ukrainian units. Ukrainians have proven that they can be a force that Russian evil cannot overcome. You can see how that last one might be designed to appeal to the whispering voices currently asking hard questions in the United States, suggesting that rather than just signing another blank cheque to Ukraine, they are being offered instead the chance to make a decisive push with purpose, followed by a reduction in commitment in Europe in the future. That might appeal to figures in the US looking to focus instead on China, you might suggest it wouldn't be seen as such a great idea by others in Europe. One of those American whispering voices, by the way, was almost certainly former President Trump, who Zelensky met in the September. Zelensky reported during his Brussels visit this week that he had told Trump that either Ukraine needed to be part of NATO or else it would pursue the development or acquisition of nuclear weapons in its own right. He added... I believe Trump heard me and said that it was a fair argument. Whether that's what he would still be saying should he win the presidential election rather remains to be seen. Especially since he's now reported as saying that he blames Zelensky for the war, not Vladimir Putin, you know, the guy who ordered the invasion of a neighbouring sovereign state. Of course, it took approximately two seconds for various voices to be raised, pointing out that most of Zelensky's plan points required the support of external partners. Not only that, but for support to go firmly into the territory that those partners have so far determinedly resisted. For instance, the provision of certain weapons, or the permission to use those weapons to strike deep into Russian territory. 
Those have been seen by a number as potentially crossing Kremlin red lines that they feared to cross. Zelensky has pushed back with his plan and argued that Ukraine's advance into Russia's Kursk region showed that much of that talk about red lines is all bluff and bluster. He said that the plan was a description of what was needed in order to bring the conflict to a close. And in that sense, it's a challenge to those partners. You say you want us not to lose to Russia. Well, if not this, if not a strategy to actually gain a strong enough position to force Russia to the table, then what? And if not now, before the potential second Trump term, then aren't you just saying that it's never? Speaking to EU leaders in Brussels, he said... You all know Russia's psychology. Russia will resort to diplomacy only when it sees that it cannot achieve anything by force. He added that the plan provided partners, for the first time, a clear justification of what our goals are, how we are achieving them, and how much this will reduce Russia's ability to continue the war. The defensive measures Zelensky wants have almost certainly been further inspired by the effectiveness of Israel's air defences against attack from its enemies in recent months. The contrast between the US administration's robust support for Israel to take the fight onto the territory of its opponents and its reluctance to do the same for Ukraine is obviously a point of some degree of bitterness. Now, of course, Hamas and Hezbollah don't have nuclear weapons, which is the key point of departure. But even so. The open question behind the plan is this. Given that most of the points are things where it is more likely than not that partners are simply not going to go there, what is the implication for its failure to gain support? Even that first point which arguably simply calls for a statement of intent. To actually join NATO, you have to satisfy all the membership criteria, which it is not clear that Ukraine does. And then, of course, all the existing NATO members have to agree. Well, since Hungary has been openly acting as the agent of Putin in such matters, it's pretty certain that's not going to happen. Arguably, this is why... The weasel words were used. The firm offer requires more substance to be in place than is currently possible. The second and third points are basically the demand for a major strengthening of Ukraine's capabilities, pushing it into strategic warfighting territory, in other words, winning the war by hitting Russia hard at home. This is an order of magnitude up from the status quo, and calls for the quelling of all the pearl clutching over the potential for the war to escalate. Except, even as we're having this discussion, it has become apparent this week that the war seems about to escalate anyway. The push from Zelensky comes as he said that North Korea is currently preparing 10,000 soldiers to join Russia's forces on the battlefield. If that actually happens, it would be the first major widening of the direct conflict and a potential momentum shift towards it becoming a wider, maybe even a world war. President Zelensky said that Russia is planning to train North Korean infantry and to engage the country's specialists in various branches of the military. The Kiev Independent reported that a Western diplomat had separately told them that Pyongyang had already sent 10,000 troops to Russia. Military intelligence is reportedly aware that some North Korean officers are already in Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine, although their exact number and their role is currently unknown. Does the entry of North Korea into the conflict make it more or less likely that NATO ends up directly involved? That is the question and the calculation going on right now in the offices of presidents and prime ministers of all the countries affected. It would undoubtedly be the biggest destabilising development for some time. 
again, should it actually come to pass. So where does this leave us? Zelensky's plan says preempt that by ignoring Russia's red lines, and that would be fine for a different world where the alliance was robust and the free nations had the courage to rise to such a challenge in the face of the enemy. There are no signs that we live in that world, so we are largely left in the passive holding position, where, let's be honest, the result of the US presidential election is likely to become the prime factor influencing the outcome of the war. A crucial issue for the shape of the global world order going forward, and yet one that very, very few of those who are actually casting their vote right now will be much thinking about, one way or the other. As the Chinese would say, interesting times.